Okay, welcome to the second lecture of data structures. Um, yeah, please keep the enthusiasm down. <laughs> no, no, just kidding. <laughs> okay, so now we talked about the different kinds of abstraction last time. Now, what did, where did we start with? We started on the data side, and what was that first abstraction? Type, type abstraction, and then and then you combine many different values to make one type, and then you can have two variables of, a, of types and combine those, and what kind of abstraction is that? Structure. Structure, that's with a struct. Remember that? And then on the flip side, on the programming side, we said that, um, what does the compiler do? Compiles. Yeah, but what, is, what does that mean? Translates Compiles. Tra it translates to a lower level language. And then you have one, state, one C++ statement, and what typically happens? It requires what? Several yeah. statements at a lower level language. Remember that? And so what, is, what kind of abstraction is that that the compiler provides to us? That's what? Statement. That's statement abstraction. And then, as a C++ programmer, you can combine many statements into a what to produce a higher level of abstraction so that you can just execute this one thing and many statements will execute. Procedures. Procedure abstraction, and in C++ they're called functions always. But, okay, so that's... And then you combine the structure abstraction with the procedure abstraction and together they make up a class. So that's class abstraction. And then at the end we got to the highest level of abstraction which is behavior abstraction illustrated here in figure 1.7. Right? Where you can have many different shapes, many different classes, as being subclasses of one superclass, right? And we'll, we'll, we will see today why this is called behavior abstraction. Um, okay, so that's behavior abstraction. Now, um, and then we said that in figure 1.7, what was this little white triangle, the symbol for? That's inheritance, okay? So we have one abstract shape, and what this says is a line, a rectangle, a circle and a right triangle each inherit from an abstract shape. And then we took a look, at, we were looking at the code, figure 1.8, and um, what kind of a diagram is this box? UML what kind? There are several different UML diagrams. This happens to be a UML what diagram? Class diagram, okay? This is a UML, and the first compartment in a UML class diagram always contains the? Name. Name. The second compartment always contains the? Attributes and the third compartment always contains the operations or methods, however you want to call them. We've got C++ terminology and UML terminology, right? So this is the abstract shape class and we have the UML figure on the right and we have the corresponding C++ code on the left. And um, what we have, what we were looking at was the um, Destructor with the, the tilde with, in front of the, an identifier with the same name as a class it indicates that it is a destructor. And then we have uh, area, which is, and what did we say virtual equals zero means in C++? In C++ terminology, that's called a what? A, well, yeah, it, that's what it is, but that's the UML. In C++, it's called pure virtual. The C++ terminology is pure virtual. In UML terminology, that's abstract. So the area is an abstract uh, method. Post condition is the area of this shape is returned. And then um, we were talking about preconditions and post conditions at the end of class. And we said that, um, so we have these uh, other methods, parameter, scale, display, and prompt and set dimensions. And uh, we were looking at the fact that scale has a precondition to it, but perimeter does not. I think that was the question that came up. And then, and what is a precondition? What happens if the user tries to, what happens if the user calls a method that has a precondition and in the, in the course of calling it, that precondition is violated? What actually happens in the program? program crashes. Yeah, it crashes and it gives you an error message as to why it crashes. So therefore, those, those, are, those preconditions are to be, I mean, violating a precondition is to be avoided. Okay. But the 
developer of the library needs to implement the precondition so that it will crash with a meaningful error message. Do you see the purpose? Because most of the time the same person who writes the library or the person who writes the library is not the same person who uses the library. Sometimes you use the library you wrote. Sometimes one person writes the library, someone else uses it. So one's the client and one's the server. The server is the person who's writing the library as a service to the other programmers that are actually using the, li the client's programmers who are using that library. But the, but the precondition is a contract. It says, if you satisfy the terms of the contract, I guarantee this is what this method will do. But if you violate the terms of the contract, then the program might crash with an error message. Is everybody clear on that? And what we're going to see today is, is how to write the um, preconditions because when you write a method, if it has a precondition, it'll be your responsibility to implement that precondition and actually write it. So we'll show you how, that, how, how to do that. Okay, so what happens in with scale, if someone calls scale and gives a negative 2 for the factor, well, negative 2 is not greater than 0, so then that would violate the precondition and the precondition will cause the program to crash and have an error message that says, oh, this precondition was violated. Give you the value of the scale so you'll see what the, where the error, you can track down the error. Okay. All right, now, um, so that was the abstract class. Now in figure 1.9, here's some more code walkthrough. In figure 1.9, we have the rectangle subclass. All right, so now, here comes some more C++ code. By the way, what are the three goals of this class? The first one is? Data learn data structures. Uh, the second one is object-oriented design. C++ program. C++ program. So we just did the object-oriented design with the UML diagrams. Now we're going to do the C++ programming, right? Now, how do you specify in C++ that one class inherits from another class. There, there it is. What is it? Narrow. No? Colon. colon. The single colon. Does everybody see that on the top? It's rectangle colon public A shape. Are you with me? Class rectangle colon public A. That colon means rectangle inherits from abstract shape. A shape. Is everybody good with this? It's the single colon. That's the, notate, that's the notation for how you make a one class be a subclass of another one. Okay, so that's inheritance. And, so, and what's the UML symbol for that? That little what? Arrow. That little Arrow. round or open triangle. That open, open triangle. Right? Okay, and so here private length double. And now look, uh, the rectangle subclass has a length and a width has attributes. Now, are there attributes in the uh, abstract class? Yes or no? no? There were not, right? But now the rectangle that has, has the attributes of a length and a width, and each one of those is double, right? Now, here is another precondition, postcondition thing. What is, in, in the public section here, when it says rectangle, double length equals 0, 0.0, double width equals 0, 0.0. First of all, what now, what is the name of that method? No, no, this one right here. What's that name? Rectangle. It's a rectangle. And, it's, and what's the name of the class? Rectangle. rectangle. So whenever you have a method that has the same name as the class with no return, nothing return, no type, what does that automatically make? All of you C++ people? That means that's the constructor. Alright? So this is our review, right? So now, with rectangle, what are length and width? Length and width are parameters. Are they the actual parameters or are they the formal parameters? Actual. No, we have a little disagreement here. <laughs> Should we take a vote? <laughs> In a democracy, does the majority rule? <laughs> What are they? Are they actual parameters or the formal parameters? Uh, they, these are the formal ones. The formal parameters are in the specification, not when you call it. The actual parameters are the, are the parameters when you actually do the call. This is not calling rectangle, this is declaring it. Are you with me? And it has the types in there. You can always, it's a clue when you have the type in there, that that's the formal parameter, right? 
Okay, so length and width are formal parameters. Now, what, does anybody know what this equals 0.0, 0 is? The default. Those are default. So if you leave off in the actual parameter, if you leave off the length and the width, it will by default call them as if you call them with 0.0. .0. Are you with me? So that's another C++ little factoid. <laughs> and now we have precondition, length greater than or equal to 0.0, .0 and width greater than or equal to 0.0, .0 right? So that's a precondition for this uh, constructor. Postcondition, this rectangle is initialized with length length and width, width. Length, that length, width, that width. <laughs> All right? Is everybody clear about that? And we'll see how this is implemented in a second. And now, um, and then we have uh, area, perimeter, scale, display, and prompt and set dimensions. Now, we're not going to bother to repeat the preconditions and the postconditions for the specification in the subclasses because that was already given in the abstract class. Are you with me? And then here, this might be a new word. You might not be familiar with this. Override. Override is new with C++11. And what it means is that it's an indication to the compiler that each one of these methods, area, perimeter, scale, display, and prompt and set dimensions, has been de declared in the abstract class. And this overrides the declaration in the abstract class. Okay, so it, it helps, with, it's not absolutely mandatory, but it helps with debugging. There, it's, a, it's, a, it's a nice feature. I, it's yet another feature of C++. I have kind of a love-hate relationship with C++. It is really a big and complex language, and there is no way we are going to be able to get into all the nooks and crannies and explain everything there is to know about C++. It would just take we would, it would just take too long. We'd get bogged down, and frequently I can predict this. You're going to ask me, well, what about this? And I'm going to say, you know, that's a C++ detail that we don't have time to go into. So, ask away anyway, because maybe it is it will be important enough to discuss. But frequently we'll just say, you know, it's it's. But the neat thing about C++ is what they've done. They've done right. And it is super, it is uh, a super efficient uh, programming language. It's, you, you can run you, co code um, optimized with a C++ compiler is really, really fast. Uh, and you can do just about anything with it that you want. Okay, so that's the uh, rectangle subclass. And the, that's the C++ code, and in figure 1.10 shows the corresponding UML diagram. So what we have then is a shape, abstract shape at the top, which is the, the box that we saw before, the UML class diagram, and then rectangle inherits from a shape, and then we can see here length and width are private because of the hyphen and type double and so on, right? It, yeah? Does every um, subclass need to have all of the methods listed? Yeah, you know, that's a good question. The question, the, uh, question is, do you have to repeat these, these methods here? And the answer is no, you don't have to. And sometimes I do and sometimes I don't, just depending on space. Okay. So yeah. But there's another little, there's another little interesting thing here. Do you, yeah, for you, the, those of you who are very graphics oriented and know, are really picky about fonts, what do you notice here about the, the fonts? It tells us. Yeah, but which one? Which one's the yeah. tell? Yeah, that is actually a part. If you look at the UML standard, the UML standard says that the abstract are slanted, and the and concrete are not. So that's actually a part of the UML standard. Was is the fonts? Is that? And you'll notice that I've tried to be consistent with that as we in all this material. Figure 1.11 now is a code walkthrough of the rectangle.cpp file, right? So what we looked at here in figure 1.9 is the rectangle.hpp file. And HPP stands for what? Right. Header file. And CPP is the implementation, okay? So figure 1.9 is the HPP. And what do we notice here up at the first two lines? 
what what directive is that with the hashtag? The, the hashtag include rectangle.hpp. Now, you guys know how the include mechanism works? What it actually does? What happens, it, it's, it's literally, it is when the, when the compiler sees hashtag include rectangle.hpp, what it literally does is at that point, it jumps to the HPP file as if it were copied and pasted right there. Do you see what I mean? You can actually, I've actually done this. I didn't believe this when I first heard it. But you, you know what you could do? You could actually, right in the middle of, a, of a, your code, of a function, you could, you, could, you could just say, hashtag include my file. And then take five or six lines of code right out of the middle of your thing and just put that in, another, in that file. You see what I'm saying? Right in the middle. And, and then and the compiler would go boom, and it would jump to that file and go boom, and then it would just jump back boom, as if it were just right there. That's all it does. It's just a mechanical, it's just a mechanical text replacement. That's all it is. It's just a mechanical text replacement. So you could combine all of this, you could combine the whole thing in one hum humongous model file with no includes. And everywhere there's include, you just paste, copy, paste, all those, all that stuff into one big file. It's called a translation unit. Does the header files need to be saved in the same folder project? Yeah, I'm gonna, we're gonna see how that works in the, in the um, DP4DS distribution. And uh, that depends on the IDE. You know, the IDE usually takes care of the organization of where all the files are. And I'll, we'll show you how that works in our, in our case. Okay, so now um, remember, so this rectangle, colon, colon, rectangle, now what's the double colon? Fully qualified, Fully qualified class name, okay? So, um, by the way, why didn't we need, let's go back to figure 1.9. Why didn't we have to say rectangle, colon, colon, rectangle here in figure 1.9? Why didn't we? Because see, we said sometimes you, have to, sometimes you need it, sometimes you don't. But why didn't we need it here? Because you are already in class rectangle. Exactly. Is everybody with that? Clear with that? It's because this is in this class. Are you with me? See, look, the, here's the open brace for the class. Class rectangle, open brace, and the closed brace is way down here. So this is inside the definition of class rectangle. So that's why you don't need it. But here in the .cpp file, we are outside that open brace, closed brace. That's why we need to f fully qualify the name. Are we good? Okay. And here now is an example of how to implement a Precondition. What was the precondition for the constructor? Length and width had to be what? Greater than zero. So what do we, how, do we, how do we implement that precondition? We say if the length is less than 0.0, .0 or the width is less than 0.0. .0. Now what is this CERR? Have you used that? That's the output, that's the error output stream. So that's like C out, only it's CERR. And the system will so we'll, we'll treat that as an error message. Sometimes it will turn the print into red, and if you want to redirect it to an error log, it can redirect it to a log. Are you with me? So that's what CERR is. It's, the, it's an error output stream, and it says, so what's going to come out, and on our system it'll come out in the console. I think in red. Okay, And it'll say, so the message is rectangle precondition violated, length and width cannot be negative. All right. And then th what does the throw minus one do? What do you suppose that does? Terminates that terminates the program. All right. And, and so nothing else executes after that point, at that point in, of the execution. But if the length, if the precondition is not violated, then we do underscore length gets length, underscore width gets width. Let's go back to figure 1.9 and let me note something. Um, let me note a coding convention that we were always going to follow in this course. What is the name of the attribute of that first attribute? This type is double, but what is its name? Underscore. Underscore length. Our convention is to have every attribute of a class begin with the underscore character. Okay? 
That's a common convention and we're going to follow it. It's, a, it's just a, there's nothing in C++ that mandates it, but we will always do that. And typically what happens is, like in this example, if we come back here to figure 1.11, then the length is the name of the parameter, and then, and then when you underscore length gets length, that tells you, you can see right away that it's the attribute that gets the parameter, that, the value of the parameter that was passed to it. Is everybody clear on that? So that's a coding convention. All right, and then rectangle area, return length times width, and underscore length, underscore width, and so on. Okay, parameter. And then, and so here's an exercise for the student. So exercise for the student, and I, and by the way, when you, when you change this, get rid of that throw minus one. <laughs> Otherwise your program will crash, and you don't want it to crash, right? Are you with me? So if, yeah? And then um, rectangle display, so here is, uh, here's what the, the display method does for a rectangle. It outprints the word rectangle, and then a new line and then length, and then the value of the length, and then the word width colon, and then the value of width. And then prompt and set dimensions uses a utility function to prompt for the dimensions. <clears throat> we'll give a demo here in a minute. And now um, in figure 1.12 is, now this is not a class diagram, this is called a component diagram. Now you remember when we just talked about hashtag include? These are the relationships between that the hashtag includes uh, uh, illustrate. All right. So, so rectangle.hpp depends um, on shape, abstract shape, a shape.hpp, and then rectangle.cpp depends on rectangle.hpp. So that what happens then is the rectangle.cpp has to include rectangle.hpp, which can in turn include a shape. So those are called component diagrams. And I should also, before we do the demo, um, show you that the throw negative one, the way we're using it, is not really like the standard way to do it. The standard way to do it is with the C++ try catch throw statement. And I'm just, I'll show you this here, but let's not go through it. You can look this up if you're interested. But you need to know that the way we're, this is the kind of like the, canonical standard way of using throw, using the throw statement in C++. But we'll just ignore that for now. And now in figure 1.14 is the grand UML diagram of our abstract shape class and then our line, our rectangle, our circle, our right triangle, and our null shape which each one of which inherits from the abstract shape. So you see how this works? A line has a length, a circle has a radius, a rectangle has a length and a width, a right triangle has a base and a height. The null shape is just for convenience, it represents no shape at all and that's, we, we, we create this, we create this in our system so that when we initialize an, em an empty shape, we'll have something, we'll have it be the null shape, we'll have it be the nothing, you know. So we'll go ahead and put that in our catalog of shapes that inherit from A shape. Are we good? Any questions about this so far? All right, so now let's, what let's do is let's demo. We're gonna do a demo. Okay, so here's our demo. So now when you open up the project, you download it uh, from the website and open up Sea Lion. It looks like this, so here's our project. Here's the project pane over here on the left. This is the Sea Lion IDE integrated development environment. And it, you might have to expand this down to see the code inside the D, this DP4DS distribution. So on um, so these are all all these projects in this uh, project list is are projects that we're gonna be a lot we're gonna be looking at a lot of them, and you are going to actually complete the code for a lot of these data structures you'll be writing the methods for them. And the one that we've been looking at in class here has been is the shape project. So we click this triangle here, or this chevron, and, <clears throat> and we can see here's all the code. So here's the circle.cpp, that's the C++ implementation file, and here's the HPP file. 
the ones that we were looking at was rectangles so here let's open up the rectangle so you, the way you look at your code there is you just double click this and so here's the code for rectangle.hpp that we looked at in class and here's the cpp code and so you just you can you know write this code uh, I mean you can look at this code and and, and uh, modify it and complete the incomplete parts of it now the way you actually run this is up here uh, there's a d this drop down uh, you select the project that you want to run. This hammer is to build, which is compile only, and this triangle is is to run. See, it, it actually says there build shape, and there it says run shape. Run is both is is compile and execute. So you go, come down here. We select. We want to run the shape project. So we come down here to shape. And so now up here it says shape, and then to run this, you just click this run shape. Now let's see what happens. And boom, there it's running. And so here's our prompt. Our prompt says there are zero dot dot four shapes. And we here's our selection. Here's our possibilities: M for make, C for clear, A for area, P for perimeter, S for scale, D for display, Q for quit. So let's make let's make a shape. So let's do M for make. Actually, let's get, get a little bit more room here. There we go. So um, so let's make a let's make a shape. So M for make press return and now it's asking us which shape so now there's five shapes numbered zero to four so let's just pick one I don't know let's just say three okay so we're gonna we're gonna make a shape in in our shape is number three and let's go ahead and make a rectangle because that's what we've been talking about here so R for rectangle and now it's asking us for the length now what if and what does it say there in parentheses prompt must be greater than or equal to zero. Well, let's do a, let's make a mistake here. Let's do negative nine and see what happens. Boop. Must be greater than or equal to zero. Length. So it'll keep asking us over and over again until we do something correct. So let's let's just put nine. All right. So the length is nine. It's asking us for the width. Let's just whatever. Let's say two. So now there now we're back to the to the main prompt again. So how can we see that we actually installed a, a an object at uh, in number three? So let's do the D for display. And which shape? Let's to look at three and see what happens. And here and so now here is disp displaying the shape that we made. We made a rectangle with length nine and width two. Huh? Pretty cool, huh? And now uh, what about uh, if we if we display um, a shape that we have not made yet like number two let's see what it says ah oh, that's null shape so if you don't make a shape all five shapes are initialized to the null shape we can let let's let's display shape number zero see that's also the null shape all right so now let's let's see if we can um let's see if we can do something else let's see if we can find the area of our rectangle so let's do a for area which shape we put it in number three so there's three and sure enough the area is nine times two which is 18 and what's the perimeter can you predict that P for perimeter which shape shape number three perimeter is 22 sure enough nine plus two is that right or nine now, 9 plus 2 is 11 times 2 is 22. Right, so that's the perimeter. But I wonder what happens if you do um, the area of, of a null shape, like number 2. So it just, it just gives it a, as a 0. Yeah, are we good? Now, um, and we could clear it, but you can experiment with that yourself. Now let's try another one. Let's try, another, let's try to make another shape. Let's do M for make shape let's do a um, oh which shape which let's put it uh, let's put it in at, at number one and now let's try to make a right triangle so T for right triangle and see what happens uh oh right triangle exercise for the student now why did we get this error message and then the program crashed here with this error message okay now where did this error message come from? Well, let's go to our code for the right triangle. So here's right triangle. 
Let's take a look at the HPP. So, hmm, that kind of looks all right. Let's take a look at right triangle CPP. Let's get some more room here. Let's go to right triangle CPP. Ah, oh, look at this. Does this CERR, that's the error stream. So anything that gets printed out on the error stream, it gets printed out in red. Okay, and what does it say? Right triangle, exercise for the student. Ah, right triangle, exercise for the student. So this is how you implement preconditions, right? And then this throw negative one, like we explained in class, this throw negative one is what caused the program to crash. And 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 we print this we print this error message. So we print this error message. So what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to come in here with the edit with this uh, editor, right? And fix this. So you're going so you need to delete this and replace it with the correct code. Now this is actually a really easy assignment. Is all you have to do is go to rectangle.cpp, right? And see how it did it. And so, and so here's the constructor for the rectangle here rectangle is the class type and this is the method and it has the same name as the class over here therefore it is the constructor and what you have to do for the constructor is um, is you have to implement the precondition okay here this is how you implement the precondition and then you and then the parameter that's passed to the constructor you set the you just set the attribute to that parameter so you just do that for a right triangle and you know the area instead of doing the length times the width you do one half the length time or base times the height and etc right so anyway that's how you and then the scale and and, and etc all right so pretty straightforward i think that's the end of our demo